Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. It is November 21st, 2019. Tonight, we're going to talk about the idea of emerging adulthood. This is a, a shift that has come out in, in the literature in the past few years, and I'll talk about that as we go. Tonight's broadcast will be a little bit heavy on theory, but I think a lot of you really attend these broadcasts and listen to these podcasts to remind yourself of a, of a sensibility, of, of a way of being with with others and specifically your children. So I won't stay away from that. I'm going to share with you the, the theory around developmental theory around emerging adulthood, but I'm also going to talk about what that means for you emotionally, psychologically, even spiritually, uh, what it means to be a parent, to be a person, to be a self and to be raising and supporting the development of another self, specifically your child. So in, in recent years, there's been a shift away from the term failure to launch. That was the term that for many years we in, in this field used to describe young adults, 18 to 27 or so, that were, were struggling with, with the tasks that we associated with normal young adult development. Um, the problem with that is that it's, and this goes again to the theory, but also to the spiritual aspect of things, it's problem focused, right? It doesn't really take into consideration um, some of the, the, the ideas that, that feed into this idea about what is normal socially, anthropologically, um, biologically, historically. It doesn't take those things into consideration. And I think, and this is not unusual for all parenting tasks, right? That, that uh, part of the thing that gets in the way for all of us as parents to be our best parent is our comparison. And, and living in a world that is dominated by should or shouldn't, how we should be raising, what things should be going on. And if I could offer one idea at the outset of, of, a, of a simple skill, a simple tool, not an easy one, but a simple tool, it would be to eradicate the idea of should in our head. So failure to launch is riddled in the spirit with the, with the idea of should and shouldn't. Like I said, it ignores human history, right? The, the, the idea about what that age means is it hasn't always been the same throughout all time and throughout all cult cultures. Like I said, it begins with judgment and comparison, not just for our child, which is a burden that they, they, they very heavenly, heavily carry on, on their shoulders, but it also is on our shoulders. I, I know I'm a father of two young adults and an adolescent and a pre-adolescent right now, and I know that something that saddles me at times is what others think I, I should be doing or where my children should be. So it can negatively affect my parenting. And again, this goes to a core concept in attachment theory. It doesn't seek first and foremost to understand. It starts comparing somebody to somebody's construct, right? Some construct about what is normal. And, and no matter how much we justify that construct, it is contrived. So it starts off from a place of, of judgment instead of understanding. Like I mentioned at the outset, anthropologically, biologically, and, 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 and sociologically, it doesn't take those things into consideration with that idea of, of failure to launch. We associate it with the idea of low motivation, with, with a delay in uh, skills that we associate with adult, adulthood, specifically financial responsibility and independence, stable relationships and overall responsibility. So that's the history. That, that's where we've come from. And in recent years, specifically with, with, uh, with a man by the name of Dr. Arnett, there's this idea that we need to shift not just the, the words, but, but the meaning, the, the, the way we think about and approach all of our children to this place of emerging adulthood. And, and in that spirit, I wanna tell you, just last night, my, my youngest, my 12 year old, uh, there, was a, there was a behavior that, that she was exhibiting. And my wife and I were, were talking about it, it was close to bedtime. And we, we discussed and came to the conclusion, let's ask her first what's going on. The behavior was unacceptable. But instead of focusing on eradicating the behavior, like I talk about in my book, in the behavioral chapter, let's just take a moment and ask her questions about what's going on. So we said, hey, this, this behavior, what are you feeling? What's happening? And at first you could feel the defense, right? She didn't hear it as, as a what's going on question. She heard it as a, you shouldn't be doing this question. And, and 
just initially responded with the defense. And then after we reassured her, we just want to understand what, what's going on for you. She was very expressive and said, yeah, I, I've been having a hard day today. And, and you could see it was visible. I mean, I knew it from the behavior uh, with, with just taking a moment to consider it anyway, but for her to be able to express it. And so we said, okay. And then we, we gently set a boundary around the behavior that we were talking about, but we gave her that outlet first. So with that idea, let's talk about what our young people, what our children are struggling with, but from a place of understanding first instead of a place of judgment or, or a, a first impulse to, to fix or to modify the behavior that's trying to speak to us because they can't. Um, first of all, we know in brain development, I mean, this is, this is, it's remarkable that we don't consider this because virtually everybody knows nowadays that the brain is not fully developed or, or mostly developed until the, the mid-20s, 24, 25, 26, 27. It happens a little bit earlier with female brains, a little bit later with male brains. That's probably not a surprise, but that the, the, tell the age of 27 that we we ought to consider the, the, the lack of brain development and, and it really being an adolescent brain. I think one of the things that excites me most as a therapist, the more we learn about, the more I learn about brain development is there's going to be a time in our lifetimes. In fact, we're, we're approaching this time when we're going to be able to identify the, the, the brain issue involved in virtually all acting out in unhealthy behaviors. We can, we can identify the antecedent, right? The, the, the stimulus or the trauma, the event that, that, that preceded or precipitated the brain disturbance, the brain issue, but we're going to be able to identify it in the brain. And it, it explains perfectly the lack of functioning in a person. And there's so much non-judgment in understanding that it's a brain issue. So it's an adolescent brain. I've joked about this fact. I don't say this in front of my children often, although I have in the past teased about it, that we call our adolescent children half-brainers. I remember years ago sitting at the dinner table. My my, my third child was saying to uh, his oldest sibling, he was saying, "Hey, I I, I learned in school." Said said to his older brother Jake, "I learned in school why you're mean sometimes." And Jake, who was a very young adult at that time, said, "What did you learn?" He said, "Well, our teacher told us that your brain isn't fully developed yet." And I was looking at Jake for the reaction, and his response was, well, neither is yours. But it's this idea, this awareness that our brains aren't fully developed until mid to late 20s. Emerging adults are, are showing characteristics of both adolescents and adults, some more on one end of the continuum than the others. Other cultures show th that there's not so much judgment, not so much taboo and shame with adult children living into their living home into their mid twenties, right? That's our idea. That's our concept. And even if we were look look back at history, we might say previous generations of children were independent at 13, 14, 15. And that is true with some cultures, but it's not a universal truth. It's a truth that is certain constructs. One of the most important things that happens in therapy, I can't overstate this, is this awareness that we experience when we get outside of our context, right? It could be another culture. Those of you who have traveled significantly will have, will, will resonate with this idea, but sitting in therapy with another person, somebody outside of the family and experiencing what that's like, we begin to understand that, that the idea, the construct, the, the way that we were taught that the world was, Growing up wasn't necessarily the way the world was. I like to say it was a truth, but it was not the truth. It's that idea that the fish is the last to discover water. A fish can't know water until it knows not water. And we can't really truly know ourselves until we have some contact with not ourselves or not our family. So there are other cultures that are different, other times that are different. Our beliefs and expectations determine our feelings and responses to our children with these challenges. It's not 
a minor issue. When I was preparing these slides for this evening, and this is not the first time that I've done this broadcast, but when I was preparing them, I was filled with that sense of it's okay. It's different. It's different. All, all of us are different. As a therapist, as a, as a client in therapy, maybe the most important experience that the client or, or I as a client can have is it's okay. Even when it's not okay, it's okay. I can just see it, be present with it, and listen to what it's trying to tell me, the, the, the behavior, the diversion, the, the regression. Learning to value the process, meaning that that I was I've shared this recently. I was recently interviewed on a, on somebody else's podcast, and I, I had the question sent to me in advance. The last question about come up with one time in your life when you really realize the essence of, of being a parent, one aspect of the essence of being a parent. And as I was considering the answer to the question, I couldn't think of any successful decisions I'd made that that, that solidified that for me. I could as a child, I could think of some things that my parents did that really gave me a sense of what it meant to be a, a parent, an effective, adequate parent. But when I was thinking about my own experiences as a, as a parent, it was all my mistakes that, that really cemented for me the idea about what it was to be a parent. So learning to value the process means learning to value the struggles, the setbacks, the mistakes. And our children, right, our children who end up in places like, like Evoke, they do a good job of exhausting our patients in that area, don't they, right? So that's why I say this consistently. That's why you need extra support. You cannot parent a child, typically, that needs to be at a program like Evoke without extra resources. And I can see from the numbers that have attended tonight, you know that, right? You, you know that that's true. Um, so valuing the process is a shorthand way of saying that, that idea. Holding space for individualization, right? It's similar to, I think there are two, I think I'll, I'll, I'll in one particular way of thinking, there are really two simple tasks as a parent, fundamental tasks as a parent. And one is developing your own sense of self. Now, that's a big task, but that's who you are, what the boundaries, what the edges of you are, what you can tolerate or not, what you're okay with or not, what you feel, what you want, what you believe, right? That, that's the fundamental, fundamental task. And then the second task is holding space for children, right? If you do the first task well enough, you have more space, more capacity, more emotional, psychological bandwidth for the child so that when you show up in your interactions with the child it's for the child and not for you but holding space for the child when we get frustrated angry disappointed sad anxious those are all likely to cause disconnection from the child they're not unreasonable feelings right they're normal feelings to the, the situation at hand, we can't not feel them. Like nobody should suggest to you that you not feel it. That would be crazy, right? But we just have to take care of it somehow, some way. Looking at family patterns and systemic implications, right? The best way to understand your child is to understand your history. That's why, and I, I say this a lot, I do not know. I do not know something more effective. And I think the literature and my experience is complete in this area. I do not know something you can do more helpful for your child than doing your own work. I, I like doing intensive work. I like doing therapy, 12-step meetings. That will create in you capacity to parent your child. Doesn't fix your child, doesn't cure their problems but it gives you more capacity to be able to deal with what is for all of us a difficult situation, even in normal circumstances, but more so, of course, when our children are struggling with mental health and addiction. So we have this idea of emerging adulthood, right? That's the sum of this idea that we're not talking about failure to launch anymore, but we're talking about 
the tasks of emerging adulthood and, and consequently the tasks of parenting emerging adults. Education like you're doing tonight, like you're getting tonight, if you're doing this live, if you're listening to the podcast, whatever time of day it is, of course, this is a part of it. This is a part of you developing bandwidth. There, there, there might already have been an idea tonight that I've shared that says, I have a, a, a fraction more patience for my child. And that is gold. So the developmental issues, what are the developmental tasks of young adulthood? In this process, emerging adults clarify their identities by learning more about themselves and their wants. The entire stage of emerging adulthood is an opportunity for self-exploration because young people are more independent from parental control than they were as adolescents. At the same time, they have not yet accepted the typical commitments of adulthood. I heard somebody say it recently, and I've heard it before. It's a time to take risks when the stakes are lower. I remember when I was considering starting my own business, Wilderness Therapy Program, 20 three years ago, 21 years ago. And I remember consulting my uncle who served sort of as my father in my life. And he said, it's the best time to do it. Later on in life, it won't be as easy. You won't be as, you won't have as much maneuverability. And so take a risk right now. And I'm glad I did, of course. Similarly, we want emerging adults to take risks, adolescents and emerging adults to take risks when the, the, the consequences aren't as significant in life, although some of them are experts at taking huge risks, I know. So the development of issues facing young adults, this is the age of identi identity exploration. The age of identi identity exploration is a time when young people explore the possibilities of who they are. And to the extent you don't accomplish this task, you will find it again in, in, in your midlife. You'll reconsider it again. And many of us know what that's like. I don't think it's just a coincidence that midlife or what we would call midlife and midlife crises seems to co coincide for a lot of families with the same time that their children are going through adolescence and young adulthood. In fact, sometimes it's the struggles that the adolescent and, and the young adult have that become the trigger for the parents' midlife questioning exploration. This exploration occurs in two main areas, love, first of all, meaning and exploring relationships. Eric Erickson, the, the foremost famous theorist on developmental uh, stages throughout the, throughout the lifespan, talked about the idea of intimacy exploration. That's the main task. And then the second area is work, attending college or exploring various career possibilities. Those are the two main tasks. It's an age of instability. This is one of the most unstable periods of our lives uh, as, as human beings because we're in flux. We're expected to take on adult responsibilities and literally we don't have some of the equipment. That is the prefrontal cortex and the wiring isn't that secure. It's the most self-focused age of our lives also. And, and again, that, that that has with it a negative connotation, but we don't think of it as negative. I always say to my, my students in the program, when they say to me, what's in it for me? I, my answer is, first and foremost, that's a great question. There's virtually nothing I want you to do in your life that I don't think is going to benefit you. It's just not the case. Even if we're talking about service and love and compassion and empathy for others, that benefits you. Yes, it benefits other people too, but it makes your life richer. So many of us have this idea. We were told we were selfish growing up, right? That's how our parents modified our behavior. When they felt flustered and frustrated with us, they told us they, that, that we were selfish. And we were children, right? We were children, so we couldn't fight back. We didn't know how. They were bigger in more ways than one. And so we, we internalized this, this shame associated with self-interest and self-development. 
when when really we're we're just struggling to figure out who we are. So in this context, it, it doesn't have a negative connotation. The age of instability. Exploration and shifting choices make the stage of emerging adulthood exceptionally unstable. This instability is best illustrated by how often emerging adults move from one residence to another. While emerging adults are aware that they need a plan for the future, this plan is subject to numerous revisions. Each revision is evidence that they have learned something new about themselves and are one step closer to identifying the kind of future that they want. In emerging adulthood, instability replaces the anxiety anxiety of adolescence as the new source of disruption and stress. When I, when I was introduced to this concept, it hadn't even dawned on me. Unless you live in a family where there's lots of moving, which some people do if you're in the military or there are other careers. But even in a successful young adulthood, when I went to college, I lived in a dozen different places. Maybe not that many, maybe 10 over the course of, of I went to school for eight years. For eight years. That's a lot of moves in eight years. I haven't moved between the age of, I started college when I was 21 and went till I was 29. I, I haven't moved my entire life combined as much as I did during that time. And I think we take that for granted. Moving is a major stressor in our lives. It's on, on the life stressor scale, it's up near the top. And I know that we just kind of normalize that because you're moving each semester, each college year. I went to three different colleges to go to graduate school for. So we kind of normalize it, but that's a lot of stress. It's a self-focused age. The emerging adulthood is the most self-focused age of life. There are few daily obligations and commitments to others. Most emerging adults will eventually commit to careers and relationships, but first they want to focus on personal goals and self-development. By focusing on their own lives, emerging adults develop skills for daily living, gain a better understanding of who they are and what they want and lay the foundation of their adult lives. Self-focus will eventually lead to self-sufficiency. So again, there's a lot of connotations in our lives for most of us because of our upbringing around self-focus, but it's a normal part, a typical part, an essential part of development that happens at this stage of life more than any other. It's an age of in-between. The three main markers of adulthood are accepting responsibility for yourself, taking over responsibilities for yourself that have previously been assumed by your parents. That's number one. Number two, making independent decisions, making important decisions without being influenced by your parents. And number three, becoming financially independent, no longer having your parents pay for all or some of your bills. Although emerging adults begin to display adult characteristics at 18 or 19, they don't come into full adulthood until sometime much later. It's just a simple model. I, I remember growing up, I kept waiting for adulthood to feel like an adult. And sometimes today, I forget. I'm 51 years old and I forget that I'm an adult. I keep expecting somebody to be there to, to kind of help me to accomplish some of the things that I'm uncomfortable with in life. Just think how much more potent it is for them. And our sensitivity to that is critical. Doesn't mean we can't have boundaries. Remember, that's the first task of being a parent is developing a healthy self and learning about the edges of what we are and aren't comfortable with. But built on that foundation, we can develop a sensitivity to the challenges, the, 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 the pressure, the angst of this stage. It's an age of possibility. For an emerging adult, the future is full of possibility. For the most part, no dreams have been permanently dashed, no doors completely shut, and possibilities for happiness are still abundant. The stage of emerging adulthood can be the best opportunity for, sub for substantive change. Independence, spontaneity, and wide open possibilities become less available as young adults embrace, embrace full adulthood. I don't even know that I need to add to that quote. It just says what it is. Similar to the, 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 the story I shared about opening a wilderness therapy program and the advice I got from my uncle. And we could go on. And I know, by the way, I know dozens of people. It's, it's, it's part of the, the, the benefit of being in the field that I'm in. I know dozens and dozens of people who made tremendous mistakes in young adulthood, including jail and prison, dishonorable discharges from 
the military due to substance abuse issues, right? Failed marriages, all kinds of tragic, in some ways, seemingly irreversible damage to their lives and questioning the idea that they would ever recover. And many of them can offer with great serenity and, and wisdom and, 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 and hope to younger people, your life is not over. But we as parents, because we care so much for the safety and well-being of our children, our anxiety for that can leak, can kind of bleed over to our children so that they look at these things with, with such with such globalized ideas about what what success and failure are. Stages of parents coping with problem behaviors in their young adult children. First shock. Young adults often live out of the home and may have been covering up the problem behavior for some time. Right? You, you learn about it when you find out your child has missed a semester of school. You learn about it when it blows up in your face, when it completely unravels. So then the second stage is attention. This isn't working. What do we do now? You start to ask questions, gather resources. You find a consultant, a therapist. You talk to parents who have been through it, and you start to get resources and op options. The third stage is action. Parents stop enabling, introduce treatment options to the young adult. Sometimes they need to set ultimatum, right? These are your limits, your boundaries to attend treatment. Detachment is the fourth stage. Fourth stage. Parental influence without control, letting go of the outcome, which is the, 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 the chasm between number three and number four is wide and deep, Right? Detachment is a lifelong task. If you want to learn about it, go to Al-Anon. The first time you're there, they will give you a pamphlet on detachment. And you'll start to hear people talk about all across the continuum. People struggling with, with spouses and children with significant mental illness and or addiction. And you'll learn about how they have learned to detach from outcomes and found serenity, and I, I must say this, become a better spouse, a better parent, a better friend, a better person in the process, and more helpful. Stage five is autonomy, time for the young adult to differentiate, parents go on vacation, right? You really start to pull, pull away, let them sink or swim. Connection is number six, developing a new relationship with your adult child that is supportive without enabling. In the early, in the early phases of, of intervention, in that shock attention action phase, you'll find yourself coming out of denial, enabling, and, and really setting things up very, very strongly, very, very powerfully. And then you'll find yourself kind of going over that 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 hump of the curve and you'll find yourself pulling away and detaching. And it's not the same thing as denial. It comes from a place of awareness and serenity and courage and strength. The key differences between adolescent and young adult clients, this is in our experience from our perspective, over 18 clients have more rights and can leave the program at any time. They must sign the contract and have the rights and have rights to confidentiality unless releases are signed. Information is shared with parents cautiously as young adults are entitled to dictate what is and what is not shared with their families. Also, young adults tend to be more entitled because of their increased rights. Therefore, holding boundaries with them in the field is a balancing act with fostering engagement. It really is a more effortful and complex process with the young adults. Three, young adults tend to be more entitled. Oh, I already mentioned that. Uh, three, parents' leverage is diminishing. However, young adults are for the most part financially dependent on their parents, giving parents still some leverage. A great deal in many cases. They have more life experience and less, and thus more urgency to get back on track. Their length of stay is shorter than adolescents. They generally have greater insight, maturity, and motivation to change. Not always true, but comparatively, they do. What are the key differences in our program? Supervision is and structure are still high. However, there's greater autonomy. Clients are encouraged to take a more active role in their treatment. We encourage more initiative. Staff take less of a parent-child relationship and are more peer-to-peer -peer while still holding strong boundaries. Clients aren't asked, for example, to turn in their shoes at night. 
because there's no run risk because they can walk away in broad daylight. The groups can be co-ed in our program for the young adults, not for the adolescents. Length of stays, like I mentioned, tend to be slightly shorter as young adults tend to enter treatment, less resistance and ready to work. Visits from parents, this is interesting. Visits from parents tend to occur more toward the later stages of treatment, say four, three quarters of the way through versus mid-treatment. Prior visits, prior to this, this visit, can be counterproductive for some clients as it may foster a desire to leave the program. Parents may visit a week or two prior to departure, allowing the, the client to leave the program independently. And we do that less with adolescents. What's the family treatment? How does that differ? It's, of course, important to understand the development of the individual and the family life cycle where everybody's at. It's a different task, different processes. Part of tonight's broadcast is really speaking to that. Becoming aware of the triggers from children. Walking is a huge, difficult situation for parents here, and it happens not infrequently. Rarely do they walk out of the program and stay out, but we walk with them for a while. We walk until they get to a paved road, and then we encourage you to let them go to a shelter in town. Parent visits, um, we don't like to have them at transition. I mentioned that on the previous, when I talked about visits, we like you to come out before the final week so that they can move to the new program by themselves and, and take ownership of it. I talk about the purity of working with young adult families versus the shortcut of custody. The legal leverage you have with the adolescent is, it's unmistakable, right? It's clear. You, you can send a child here without their, without them granting permission. Young adults, you kind of have to, it's an art form. It's, it's more complex. I, I say it's more pure because you can't fall back on the legal right of a parent to, to dictate treatment. You have to say no. You have to come up against the edges, like I said, of who you are and what your boundaries are, what you feel comfortable with. We encourage parents to attend 12-step programs. We encourage all of you, but I think it might be more fundamentally important for parents of, of young adults because of the subtlety. I don't want adolescent parents to not attend. Let me just say that very clearly. But, but it's even more of a mandate for parents of young adults. I, I think everybody in the world could benefit from 12-step attendance, from Al-Anon and Codependence Anonymous. I went earlier this week. My wife is going to be there in 30 minutes. It's just part of our lives. It's, it's, it's understanding. It's listening. It's reminding. It's similar to listening to me on these podcasts or reading a, a favorite book or daily reader. It's reminding yourself of a sensibility because if I haven't said it tonight, very few of us were raised with, with a clear sense of what it meant to be a person and to be connected to another person in, in this way that, that we learn as we go through the process when a child struggles like, like yours have, like mine have, like I did. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Some adults come ready and really fly because they are ready for the change, unlike adolescents. It may be okay if they don't struggle in the same way being out there. They will still be challenged physically and emotionally. Some may not hit a wall until the next phase of treatment. So the, the trajectory can be different. Many young adults enter the program willing and excited, then hit a wall for the first couple of days because it's not what they expected. Even though they read the literature, signed themselves in, it still feels different. It doesn't matter how much you think you can prepare your child. Even parents that say you will hate it when you get there, but it will be wonderful in the end. You can't quite know it until you're there. The highest list, risk, excuse me, the highest risk for a young adult leaving the program is, is typically within the first couple of weeks. It may take them a few weeks, three weeks, to, for the average client to acclimate to the program. The most significant treatment results tend to occur generally from week five on. These young adults often then hit a plateau where they feel their work is over in the wilderness and they're ready to move on. Getting them through this plateau and continuing to progress is an important milestone. And aftercare is different. 
if the adolescent has made more progress, is more open, is more insightful, is more accepting, it can start to look more like a young adult. But generally speaking, there's this difference. We begin introducing young adults to consider aftercare planning a few weeks into their stay. Most enter treatment thinking they'll just be in and out in 35 days. So it takes careful planning to prepare them gradually to take a more realistic view for change. It's not a bait and switch. It's just that it takes all of us a lot more time. And even when you tell a young adult it's going to take more time, that everybody believes that they're the exception to the rule, don't they? Right? There's a phrase in, in recovery called terminally unique. I'll be the exception. It's important that they be involved in this process, the process of planning, considering, and gradually accepting the idea of aftercare and, and embracing it. Most of the time, young adults come around and not only accept the need for follow-up treatment program, but even embrace it. And that can be true for the, the adolescents that, that make more progress too. Typically, clients are given two to three choices in programs to consider that parents feel comfortable with and are then encouraged to make the final decision. Again, can be true with adolescents, but more often true with young adults. Walking obviously is, is a greater risk for young adults because they can. We don't think of this as disaster like, like it is with adolescents who run from the program, which happens less frequently than walking. Um, it can often be a turning point, a catalyst for change. A recognition is, uh, of the futility of an old way of coping, of the escape instinct uh, of coping. We view walking as an opportunity to intervene, not as a walkout. Some clients just need to experience asserting their adult right to leave so they can feel control. I've heard young adults, even recently a parent shared with me their story, that they needed to kind of save face. They needed to choose back in. Often they return... And this can provide a powerful learning experience and a shift in treatment. The process can be used to whole, highlight the old escape pattern that I described. And the idea is that wherever you go, there you are. Making this challenging for them, not offering them a ride out, but requesting that they hike out, it gives them the time. We, we try to facilitate that the best we can and in all cases that we can. Maintaining them leaving on our terms and not theirs, asking that we provide staff support and leave when this is in place. Give asking, give us some time to support you. Letting go and not emotionally reacting to the decision, taking the position of not trying to convince them to stay, but rather letting them own the choice, embracing their resistance while letting them bear the anxiety about their situation. You'll be coached along this process. Strategies for, for when if a young adult decides to walk involve having them join the group off of Earth Phase sooner to and using the group to normalize their experience and help them feel connected and supported and discouraging their their departure peers have been through this ahead of them so they can use that that positive peer culture to give feedback from a position that's non-threatening it's not an adult not a power not an authority figure involving parents with a satellite phone call where parents set the boundary and not offer support should the child leave is a very common intervention, similar to an intervention. Parents are coached by the therapist to let go and allow their a young adult child to own the reality, own the reality of, of what it means to walk. If clients leave the program, we have used a homeless shelter in St. George or in Bend, Oregon, giving them our, our contact information should they choose to return, which sometimes, more often than not, they do. This can offer them a dose of reality while giving them a space to explore their decision. Clients who are at risk and leave against medical advice can be referred to an appropriate psychiatric hospital against their will if necessary, if they are a, a risk to themselves, an overt risk to themselves, we can make that referral. And I, 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 most people know that in most states that that's the fact. It's a short-term solution, but it can get them medication and stabilization and safety. According to the Department of Education figures for, for 2000 through 2006, 30% of college students leave in their first year. And an astonishing 50% of those students never graduate. It's amazing. The 2000 National Household Survey on Drug Use reports that 18 to 25-year-olds have the highest rates of illicit drug use 
19.7% and alcohol. Heroin and uh, methamphetamine use among young adults has quadrupled in the, in the last 10 years and continues. These are older statistics, but it continues to be on the rise. And I don't need to tell you all, all that because the opi opioid epidemic, which includes heroin, is prolific. According to the National Institute on Mental Health, one in four young adults will experience a major depressive episode by 24. That's profound. Young adult suicide rates are 12.5 per 100,000, higher than the national average of 10.9 per 100,000, making the third the third leading cause of death for this age group. In adolescence, it's the second. What are the take-homes? Each individual is unique. We, 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 we are encouraging you to, to look at development through the lenses of biology, psychology, and sociology to remove the, the, the frame that tends to shame both your child and you about what should be happening. Work with parents on beliefs, expectations, and attachment, right? Starting with the development of self. I, I did a podcast, a webinar on self and parenting. That's the place to start. And then learning what it means to hold space for the child while still maintaining that sense of self or those sense of boundaries. Look at systemic issues to determine the level of health or pathology, right? How much of it is about the system? The, the, when I, my greatest accomplishment as a therapist often, not just with parents in our program, but I was training recently one of our staff members, a, a parent of several children that are all young adults. And the staff person said to me, I'm beginning to think that many of the things that I did were wrong. And I wanted to cheer and I wanted to say, yes, that's it. That means you're, you're, you're going past shame and guilt and you're willing to think, I didn't know everything and I've made mistakes and I've contributed to the problem. And I can still hold my child accountable. But I can develop greater empathy and, and a greater awareness and, and a greater base as a person from which my child can learn to operate. That's a lot that I just said, but essentially it is this. The more I can own my own stuff, the more parental work that I do, which includes a, a more critical and careful evaluation of my own history, the more capable I am of providing my child with what they need. You work on boundaries informed by what I've talked about already. And then, like I said, you maintain compassion and value the, the, the journey, including the setbacks and the detours. I have a couple more important things to talk about, but if there are any questions, I'm going to save questions till the end because I want to talk about these. I'm going to be in Southern California uh, in the South Bay on December 1st. Um, uh, so that's from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m. RSVP to Melanie at evoketherapy.com. That's the last parent support group of 2019. So limited space, let us know if you would like to attend. I wanted to get to this slide because I can't overstate this. This is, in my opinion, one of the, the most under talked about things you can do for your child. You've invested so much time, so much money to your child, four and a half days, five days, $3,500 is what it costs. And, and this has made the biggest, this is what my first chapter in my book is about. This is me doing mine. And now I've done one every year since then, two in one year. Our intensive or retreat is called Finding You. December's filled up already. You can get on the waiting list, but we have spaces in January that, that are filling up. These are filling up more and more and more. We also have couples intensives, family intensives, professional intensives, and of course the individual Finding You. If you want more information, go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Pursuits trips are adventure trips, camping trips, outdoor trips all around the world for young adults or family, anywhere from a few days to a month. We ask all current parents to attend 12, six 12-step 12 support groups minimum. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous, go to the web to find a meeting in your area. When you get there, ask others and they will more than happily tell you about other meetings that they really like. Adultchildren.org 
has, has a good look uh, about your, if you have a sense of your family growing up being unhealthy, adultchildren.org is great. It was, it was made for the adult children of alcoholics, but it doesn't have to be a, 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 an explicit alcoholic in your family. It could just be an unsafe. I think it's an underutilized resource. Alateen is for teens. Refuge Recovery is a Buddhist-inspired recovery program that focuses less on a higher power, a lot of mindfulness practices. And NAMI.org, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, is a great resource that has local chapters in all major cities where you can go and find free resources and classes and offerings. All of these broadcasts are available on the Prog podcast app. Please go there and subscribe. Share these with your friends, with, with acquaintances. We think these are wonderful resources and, and a great gateway into self-help and therapy for the entire family. If you have an iPhone or an iOS device, just use the, sound, the, the, the podcast app. If you have an Android device, you can use the SoundCloud app or go to soundcloud.com on your computer. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find Evoke Therapy programs using the handle at Evoke Therapy, or you can find the Summit Lodge on Instagram using at Evoke Summit Lodge. On Facebook, you can find Evoke Therapy programs using that handle, or the Alumni Foundation, you can find on Facebook by using Alumni Family Foundation. We need more volunteers. There, there's some turnover in the board. This is an organization that helps to raise money for people who can't afford treatment and other free services. So you want to get back, you want to reach out, reach out to the Evoke Family Foundation. They're looking for new members, new board members. The Evoke Therapy blog is a great resource for, for content. My book, I'll be happy to say soon, not my only book, is available on Amazon, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. You also can get an audio audible version there. Anytime you go to Amazon, you can go through the Parent Alumni Foundation book page. And if you buy a book through that page, it's the same price. A percentage goes to the foundation to help people that can't afford therapy. All right. I'm happy to take any questions, any live questions that have come up for any of you. Looks like there are none. So it means, hopefully, I've either, either over, overwhelmed you, lost you, or I've, I've spoken fairly comprehensively and completely. Okay, this is a big deal. The next webinar, the next broadcast, we're going to have a special guest, somebody who is an expert in insurance claims. Uh, we'll give you secrets, tools, shortcuts, resources for insurance claims for wilderness therapy. So if you're interested please attend that. You can also pass this link off, the podcast link off to people who might need it. That'll be this Monday, November 25th at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Insurance Claims for Wilderness Therapy. I look forward to co-hosting that, that, that with him, with our special guest, and that'll be this Monday. So thank, thank you for and on behalf of your children for, for showing up. It takes great courage. The, the name of my book, the, the, the Heroic Parent, comes from the idea that, that to be able to willing to look at yourself, to look into your past, especially when it's not you who has the overt struggle, is a heroic task and is a rare task. And for me, it is the most liberating experience. Sigmund Freud said that the purpose of therapy was freedom. And what he meant by that was that the awareness gives you more choice, more autonomy more agency in your life. So I hope these these points of contact are helpful. I'm excited to provide them for you. They're, they're, they're great for me. And thank you, like I said, for and on behalf of your child for the work that you're willing to do to show up here. Take care, folks, and I'll see you Monday evening. Bye-bye.